So let's have a lesson on uh, Hazy Drove Man's Desiring by Johann Sebastian Bach. And this is from Cantata BWV 147. The cantatas are really awesome to listen to um, if you're into like, if you want to know about Baroque music and you want to know about Bach in particular, the cantatas, not this particular piece necessarily, but the cantatas overall are so great because you have instruments playing and you have voices singing and you'll really get a different sense of what Bach was actually all about. Um, if you only listen to like piano works, uh, the keyboard works of Bach and you listen to players like Glenn Gould and stuff and I, I love Glenn Gould but um, you'll get a weird sense of like this kind of clockwork um, style of playing Bach this kind of puzzle piece way of playing him but if you listen to the cantatas you hear a, a, strings and, um, a, and other uh, instruments playing these musical lines and you hear the same lines sung by the human voice and it's so legato and so beautiful and um, it's just a really different experience. And you, if you want to know about Bach, you should listen to the cantatas. There's tons of them. And um, I particularly love the chorales. It's, um, they're just so beautiful. But that said, um, if, like I said, um, you try to know everything about a composer um, before you start choosing a way to play them. And I think the cantatas are so perfect because there's so many different instruments and, and ways of delivering the music. You get a good sense of what Bach is really about. That said, this is one of the most famous melodies from this cantata and from Bach in general. Um, it's a great piece for weddings and things like that, um, particularly like the signing of a wedding. Um, I play it for that often. Um, just because of the nice, the nice mood that it has. Um, so of course this is an arrangement of an a work that has a lot more to it, right? So it's a huge reduction, but it's so well known that um, it, it you can play it and, it and it makes sense because people know it so well, and it's so tuneful. Now I have I based this off the actual cantata, so I took essentially um, some of the string lines and whatnot, and then added in some of the accompaniment, but not so much to make it um, overly complicated. I wanted the piece to be um, available for people and um, available for them to play at gigs or for intermediate players to kind of just um, perform for their own enjoyment, rather than it being too academic, which is kind of silly in the first place anyway, because it's such a reduction of an original score that there's kind of no way to be academic about it anyway. That said, Bach arranged um, melodies from all sorts of sources and arranged them on different instruments, so he was totally fine with this kind of mixing and mashing and arranging process of his music. My first piece of advice is to realize that the piece has two musical lines. It has the upper line, one, So um, you want to practice just that upper line and if you're more on like the beginner side you might want to just play the upper line but and then there's also this lower voice and then of course you're going to put them together but you want to retain some of the independence of each of them Kind of tough sometimes because of the fingering. There's always these chord shapes to deal with. So some notes might get clipped a little bit, but just do your very best to hold on to them. two musical lines to remain independent and be played at the same time. That's part of the beauty of Baroque music and music of other time periods, of course. But that's called counterpoint, right? Or, and, but in this particular case, just we're looking for voice independence. Each voice is horizontally intact. Um, it all sits in the guitar fairly well. There's just a few spots that are a little bit, a little bit tricky. In terms of fingering, just Mainly use I am on the upper voice. Throw in the A finger when um, when you have um, an upper string come into play from out of nowhere. 
Um, or when there's arpeggios such as bar eight. Um, you know, you can throw in all those three fingers kind of across those strings, but um, just make sure you're always alternating your right hand fingers. I'm trying not to repeat fingers. That'll interrupt the flow of the music. Um, it's not the end of the world if you do it after a thumb plays a note, like if it's only the thumb. Um, but besides that, just always be alternating fingers and never repeat any. In terms of the left hand, there's just going to be lots of use of the third and fourth finger across strings because there's so much cross stringing in this. Like in right in bar two. You just have to make sure that whenever you have to jump across strings that you aren't going like that, but you're going. But I've notated that, so just follow the fingering. And um, besides that, there's a couple of spots where you have to hold on to a note and then, and then um, kind of extend your fingers a little bit or something like that. But it's not the end of the world. Just try to hold on to the notes as much as possible. Sometimes you'll be playing scale passages. Sometimes it'll sound more like chords. Try to make it sound like chords as much as possible. Um, one example would be the spots where... The reason I'm playing the D there is that I didn't really want to go... And just have like, like this, but... You want it to all ring out. It can be as legato as possible and you get some sense of the harmonies as well because some places in this piece you're going to lose the harmonies other places you'll you'll get them quite nicely that's just the normal part of uh, of arranging right um a couple of specific spots to talk about um if you if you're unfamiliar with pivot bars like down in bar 25 26 27 It's just when you're playing like this, you see the first fingers playing a normal G sharp there, and then it folds over. So that way the G sharp can continue ringing out, but you can get that C without having to go like that or something. So that's just that pivot into a bar. So that's called the pivot bar. And I've just marked it as pivot B1 there. So that's pivot bar the first fret. Um, besides that, there's, um, there's a couple of trills in the piece. Um, I would leave them out. If you're more of an intermediate or beginner player, just leave the trills out. If you really want to add them in, um, the first one at bar 16, you could close it on the third string and go like that. I did a cross string trill. And the way you, that you do that is, it's kind of like a suspension from the beat before, but you play the B from the, this is the second beat of bar 16, and then play the thumb and the A finger, and then M, I, thumb. So again, P and A on the outer notes, so that would be a B, because you want to start the trill from the upper auxiliary or the upper note. So you start from the B and the D, then you play the A, B, A with the thumb. So P, A, M, I, thumb. It's kind of like a tremolo pattern. It's just like thumb and A, and then M, I. Uh, and it comes out. So you play, 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 thumb. And it's nice if you linger a little bit on the actual upper auxiliary. Yeah, ba -da -ba. Um, and I think all of the trills that I added today were like that. So the one at the very end of the piece, same idea. This is the um, second to last bar of the whole piece and the last beat. So you play D, open G, and then you're going to go F sharp, G, F sharp. Same fingering, thumb, A, M, I, thumb. 
It might seem weird to cross over to do awkward string crossing with M and I across the strings this way. The reason you do this, and I used to do my cross string trills in an ergonomic way with the I M there, but I don't anymore because it's like, I'm so used to going A M I like in tremolo or something, or in just a normal arpeggios, that it, it makes sense to actually like just use that reflex reflexive um, pattern. Uh, it's like a reflex in your hand, right? You can do it slower too. Or just don't do it at all. Um, if, if you're more on the beginner or intermediate side, just do, you don't have to worry about doing the trills at this time. And you can practice them in the background for your technique. You can look up cross string trills and practice them a lot. And then when you want to add them in later, once they're feeling really good, go ahead and add them in. One last part I want to talk about is just bar 45. Because the second finger has to hold down the G, um, it's going to be a little bit of a stretch between the third finger and the index when you have the second finger down. Um, but it's pretty secure because you get to really hold down these notes. But you just want to let as many notes ring out as possible so you get some sense of the harmony through there. So besides that, I think that's all we really need to talk about. The rest is pretty self-explanatory. It's not that difficult. Um, but just take it slow, practice the difficult parts, go through the whole piece, circle any part that gives you trouble and just make sure you really know those parts. And then um, I think you'll have the whole piece. And it's a great one to have in the repertoire just for gigs, your own enjoyment or the holidays um, and for special occasions and things like that. So enjoy. <laughs>